The current Afghan government is in a deep state of crisis now, um, not only because of the insurgency, which of course prevents them from uh, exerting any significant control over a large part of the country, but just because the degree of dysfunctionality of government institutions, particularly sub-national administration, but I would say most ministries as well, has reached such a stage where really, you know, the, the government is becoming totally unable to provide services, to even be aware of what really was going on in the country. Um, I mean, some ministers are worse than others. The Minister of Interior was a major uh, part of crisis. Now there is a new minister appointed. We shall see what he can do. He's a reformer, but I'm sure he will face a lot of resistance in the attempt to reform the administration. In general, Akhenaz is a country which always suffered from with government. Uh, even when the government was, the country was stable in the, say, the 70s and 60s and 50s, um, the government was functioning but wasn't going too deep, uh, particularly in the countryside. So you would have this administration running over 100, 150 villages, but virtually no government presence beyond that, except in the, in the, in the shape of schools mainly primary schools and not everywhere. So there are provinces where schools never arrived. Even now there are provinces where rural uh, literacy is down to 0.2% or something like that. So practically zero. Um, meaning that no schools were ever established there. You know? um, so it was always a very kind of you know, uh, superficial upper layer, um, not affecting too much the way society was functioning. And then of course 20, 30 years of war, Makes things, makes things much more complicated. Uh, it, it is true, I think, that in the past, in the 60s, 70s, the government was not too corrupt compared to South Asian standards, for example. I think it was less corrupt than the, either Indian or Pakistani states. Um, now, the situation is completely different. Uh, it's certainly one of the most corrupt governments on earth. Uh, you can look at the you know, international index as a measure of corruption. And, you find a confirmation of that, but all anecdotal evidence and what people say also point in the direction, so it's my own personal experience that corruption is very widespread. And every time you go to the airport, you have to pay some bribes just to, just to get through. So, um, so I would say it's a very dysfunctional government, and uh, things have been getting gradually worse since 2002. And uh, I mean, it's difficult to imagine them getting further worse. Um, there have been attempts to reform it, but you know, when, you, when you reach a certain stage of um, the sanctionality, it becomes very difficult to reform because there are now powerful lobbies uh, in some ministries, for example, which oppose reform because you know, they, this corruption allows people to make a, you know, a lot of money being involved in the narcotics trade or whatever. Um, so these lobbies will resist being kicked out of the business and uh, they're quite powerful ones. the southern strongmen, the Pashtun strongmen warlords, because they are a kind of more fluid structure, you know, they, they are, were not, the, you know, the organization were not so solid, so consolidated, were not essentially based on military charisma. It was more like kind of semi-tribal structures where somebody with some influence and some money was able to establish himself at the top uh, and through the distribution of patronage create a network around yourself. And these things are not very solid. Um, they are easily tackled by the central government. Uh, sometimes they are co opted into the central government, sometimes they are um, eliminated or weakened by the central government. Um, and there, there is a relationship. So these strongman structures, they gave way to the Taliban because they were, when they existed, they were creating some kind of opposition to the Taliban. They were at least controlling territory in some ways or have influence, there are men around which represent some kind of barrier to the Taliban because of course they didn't like the Taliban, the Taliban were of course to their interest. As they were weakened or, or removed, then they created a vacuum which was not filled by the government but by the Taliban. When you really have warlords in the north, in the west, um, you still can say that the weakening of the warlords is just happening. Uh, in part because of internal fragmentation, in part because of pressure from the government, 
you can say that that gave way to the Taliban yet. Although the Taliban are beginning now to try to infiltrate these regions as well, it's a bit too early. There are some signs that there, there's some real success in infiltrating, but we're still at the early stages. And it's difficult to establish a you know, relationship between the awakening and the expand, expansion of the Taliban. It's a bit too early. There are many remote parts of Afghanistan which uh, were never affected very much by government. I mean, of course, in terms of you know, percentage of population, they don't represent such a large percentage because these are rather sparsely populated areas. The main population centers were the first ones to be targeted by the government in history, and they were the ones which were under some kind of tighter control. Um, but if you look at the you know, s surface of Afghanistan, most of it is marginal. I mean, the, the, you know, the big population center, the big concentration of population is in a few areas, and most of it is mountains, you know, which are where the nature is sparsely populated. So in these areas, traditionally, the influence of government was always weak. Um, but it is exactly in these areas that the Taliban first established themselves as they became an insurgent force. In, um, 2002, 2003, and then expanding 2004, etc. So I would say that now, because of the nature of this war, um, there are really not many areas which are unaffected. Uh, in a sense, the Taliban are bringing the most remote parts of Afghanistan into the, if you like, the, the political mainstream in one way, uh, by turning them into their own um, logistical area for this war, you know, where they recruit people, where they mobilize people, um, and then they bring these people to fight against the government in, in more vital areas, like along the highways, uh, along the main cities. At the same time, they attract retaliation in the form of incursions by foreign troops or whatever. You know, so these areas are becoming uh, battlegrounds as well. So in a sense, it's like a, the revenge of remote Afghanistan, you know, forgotten Afghanistan over the more uh, well connected, the better connected uh, areas, you know, the, the cities and you know the, the areas around the cities where, which are the uh, economic and demographic core of the country. Afghanistan is really a country of mullahs. Um, I, I think I estimate that probably three percent of the population is mullahs, and then if you include the fact that. Mullahs are most likely to have more than one wife, or at least more likely than the average Afghan, and to be rather prolific in terms of in children. Um, probably 15% of the population is somehow, you know, can be described as clerical, yes, um, or at least being very close to the clergy. Plus, people are influenced by the clerics because you know the clerics preach in the mosque and create the mosque tend to be filled with people. Maybe not all of them. Uh, take what the Mullah say to the letter, but still clearly they have an influence. So I think it's a, it's a, it's a country which is very much influenced by Islam, that the clergy plays a, now more than ever an important political role, and the Taliban are expression of this, I think. Um, at the same time, you know, it's also a country which has been influenced by what, foreign countries, including Russia and the Soviet Union. So we say there are traces of that left in Kabul, in the north, mainly, where uh, the Russians actually are not unpopular. Uh, people don't seem to have bad memories about the Russians in this northern half of the country, um, in part because I think to the end, the Russians were actually helping them against the Taliban, or at least helping the, you know, the so-called United Front against the Taliban in the late 90s and uh, before, the, before the Taliban. Um, I think Iran is a country which has cultural influence you know, throughout the northern half of the country. Um, in the south, you could say, you know, Pakistan has an influence. Uh, of course, that influence does not go against uh, Islam and the Mullahs. In fact, quite the contrary. Often, this influence is exercised by Pakistani Mullahs or clerical parties or movements. So it's not at all with it. Uh, I would say that, particularly the northern half of the country and the, the highlands, are um, more open to foreign, foreign influence of various kinds. Even now, 
you know, Western influence is stronger in these areas than it is uh, among Pashtuns and particularly in the South. So, I think it's, it's a mixed picture, but uh, certainly I wouldn't say that the influence of the clergy, you know, on the whole, has been weakening. Um, in fact, I think the, the clergy has been standing numerically in the 80s because of this money coming, particularly from Arab countries, is in the form of Islamic charities or directly pumped by, uh, pumped in by the uh, Mujahideen parties. Um, that led to not only a numerical expansion, but also a, a growth of the clergy as a percentage of the population, you know, from maybe 2% to 3% today. These are very rough estimates, inevitably. But I think, you know, Afghans became more clerical during, you know, since the 80s than in whatever before, because, it, you know, of course, wool is not working, being supported by the villagers. Um, you know, they can, they can only have so many mullahs, you know, the burden for villages to support a unlimited number of mullahs and their families uh, would have been too high for further clerical expansion. But in the 80s, um, and then with the Taliban regime, uh, being a mullah became uh, rewarded in a different number of ways, you know, with external money coming in, and but the mullahs taking different roles, like participating in government, for example, or the judiciary coming, Islamic judiciary is so offering new avenues, you know, career avenues to mullahs. So there was a there was a trend which led to this clericalization, and I think this clericalization now conflicts with the attempt to bring Afghanistan back to the seventies in a sense to uh, build a kind of secular state, if you like, because of course that eliminates all this um, you know opportunity for the clergy. While well, at the same time the clergy remains numerically strong. So the, the marginalization of the clergy, I think, contributed to its radicalization. Um, the clergy reacts to you know, the, the loss of influence um, by sympathizing to a large extent with the Taliban. I think for the moment being, for the foreseeable future, Poppies are, are going to continue to grow in Afghanistan. I think the essentially the counter narcotics strategy is, is, is frozen. You know, it's still officially there, but nobody's really pushing hard for it, for it to happen. Um, if it will be um, again coming to, to the forefront of uh, Afghan policy in the future, it will be targeted at areas where the poppy harvest isn't supposed to support the insurgency. So it would be not an indiscriminate counter narcotic strategy but focus on fighting the, the insurgency. That is allowing the people to grow poppies if they don't uh, support the insurgents. So it will not be a real counter narcotics in a sense. There are educated women, there are not so many. Certainly they would be happy to have a bigger role in Afghan life, you know, social life, political life. But as I said, there are not many. I mean, um, the female middle class is probably one to two percent of the female population. And then you have a larger number of educated women who probably have mixed attitudes. Uh, I mean, people, women with primary education or high school education who probably don't work, most of them, but at least they don't work in a, you know, outside the, the family. Um, so they can be disguised middle class, um, who might have been influenced by some of these ideas, in some cases, but certainly not in all, and they probably account for another 10%. Um, the rest are women. First of all, it's very difficult to know what they think, because it's not that it's easy to survey that, you know, nobody really has been very successful in doing that. Um, but there is little evidence that you know, there is an anxiety for emancipation or for freedom, uh, which in a way could not be supported economically or financially, because you know, if you don't work, you're not going to probably have many chances to enjoy opportunities outside the, the home. Um, most of the population never lives in villages, so it's difficult to imagine you know, what kind of opportunities could be available there. Um, so I think you know, there is a constituency for female emancipation, but it's a small one. It's a very small one. And uh, 
I think the, the prospects now are that this is going to be forgotten. You know, I mean, they, there is still a lot of rhetoric about this, but um, from from the point of view of the government, which was initially committed to favour of female emancipation, this is being rolled back, and the government is more inclined to court conservative rulers trying to show up his position and maybe attract some of, some of them away from the Taliban, which of course goes against any kind of female emancipation.